Welcome to a Monday show. About 10 minutes before 2 o'clock in Podcastville. Monday, August 15th. Um, several things to get to before we get to Alex, who is a guest on a podcast where she is a co-host on. She's actually not here. We uh, we recorded this last week. You may or may not know. Well, you know, you definitely know because you hear how I do some podcast episodes with some guests. Well, um, I did not have a local guest last uh, l- scheduled last week, and thankfully, I have enough usually where I don't e- ever have to scramble for somebody. Um, but I had been waiting, and I had an opening on the calendar for Alex to be the guest for Contact, our Cumulus Media Community Affairs show that runs Sunday morning across all the Cumulus stations. She was just that. Uh, You did not hear that unless you heard it on the radio. That will be the chunk of today's podcast content in just a couple of minutes. So you can get a better idea if you don't know already what Alex does for her job. This is not it. Um, Her uh, her work and duties at uh, neighborhood properties and as she oversees right down the road, the Wellness and Recovery Center. Um, Some other things to get to. First of all, we'll talk more about these as we get closer to like two and a half months to election day. I was part of a a breakfast to do a mini kickoff for the library levy that's coming up. All of these, these important institutions that I think we all like a great deal, um, they are not new taxes, which we said a lot of during the um, mental health levy back in May, which passed. Uh, let's do that again for these. Hopefully, we'll vote yes for these levies, and I do think there will pretty be, be a pretty decent turnout for this election. Um, you may have seen that the primary turnout a couple of weeks ago, August 2nd, was like 7%. Not surprising. I think we will probably have the second highest turnout of every four-year election cycle because this is a um, the governor uh, in that position is is up for voting um, with DeWine's position. So I think we'll have a good turnout, and hopefully you'll vote yes to these levies for the library, the Imagination Station, and the Metro Parks. I would say those are delightful institutions that we all use quite regularly, perhaps Metro Parks most. Um, hopefully you have began to use the library for more than just books or maybe Everything but books with all the great services they offer. And the Imagination Station, always a good place for kids. Lots of great programming. I think they did a great job as their part of Jeep Fest, which was, from everything I can tell, from my perspective, and I did a lot of walking around. I saw a lot of happy people, uh, a lot of happy strangers, a lot of happy happy friends. Um, It seemed like a roaring success, as did all the other events this weekend. Four or five years ago, we quickly went from, all right, let's go do this. It's it's the only thing going on to we have a lot of things happening. I began to question whether all of these events, new, old, really old, um, were going to make it. But from all accounts, I've come across the Mommy Summer Fair was a success, even without the parade. Oliver Hazard Day, amid the downpour, a, a big success in Waterville, barefoot at the beach, at Mommy Bay. Also a success, the uh, Taste of India. And did I was I did I botch that all last week, calling it the Hindu Festival? I thought the first article I read to get the, the word out about it a couple weeks ago called it that. Uh, that festival yesterday at Centennial Terrace was a big success as well. So all these events, so much to do. Maybe the busiest weekend of the year was a big deal. And all, all were very well taken care of. Next up, Pride, week after, Gaff. Labor Day, Little Gaff, and then we swing into fall. Fall looms. Um, a couple of the serious topics real fast. Anne Heche was taken off of light support yesterday. Um, she was declared brain dead on Friday from her injuries from the accident, which we'll come back to in just a second. But she was taken off life support because um, someone was found to donate her organs to. She had always wanted to be an organ donor. I was caught up to speed with this after reading about... Um, a lot of Anne Hayes stories, obviously, late in the week. Let me find the exact Alex quote. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Um, Alex was one of the many people watching uh, Dancing with the Stars with Anne Hayes, whenever that was. And I'm I'm paraphrasing this a little bit. And I guess Alex looks back now and and wonders maybe we should have seen that there were more problems that people should have gotten in touch with her about. We don't know. Maybe they did. Um, but from what I read. On Friday, 
Um, it seemed like her life began to spiral in some some really bad ways with a lot of tumult, some demons after her breakup with Ellen. Um, I think she was most recently with Thomas Jane, who has been in the expanse for quite some time, I believe. Uh, she had children, but it seemed like there were a lot of demons circling her. Uh, if you didn't know, this fiery car wreck that ultimately took her life, uh, she was under the influence. I believe the LAPD is now no longer investigating that as any kind of DUI, considering the circumstances, as she is no longer here. Um and they would have gone from uh, DUI felony to DUI misdemeanors, but that's just some some legal stuff right there. And you wonder, as often this comes up, when um, I'm out talking with my friend Jen Wakefield from the Lucas County Suicide Prevention Coalition, um, overdose deaths can be hard. My friend Mosh from the health department has better data on this, but a lot of times it can be hard to tell whether or not in an overdose someone was intentionally trying to take their life or... Something more unfortunate uh, had happened in in that case. Um, We don't know with Anne Heche whether she was recreationally using drugs or alcohol or whatever it might have been. And she might have craved the end of her life. And if that was the case, as I've said many, many times, there's a great line from... Which one? Which one was it? Uh, I think it was Captain America Civil War. Cap tells Wanda, and I i had said something like this for a long, long time, but he's the star, so I will, uh, I'll just mix it. I'll, I'll use what he said. Um, and I, I guess I'm paraphrasing again here. We can save a lot of people. We can save a lot of lives, but we can't save everybody. I know there are people, regardless of the amount of resources we throw at people, we give to people, we tell them about. We can't save everybody. People sometimes will lose the battle with their minds and take their lives. And it, when and if they do, I hope they choose to not do it in some type of public fashion where others are harmed. Um, I use the example of when there was a gentleman who, what, I think he came down from Monroe County and it was somewhere on Monroe, or maybe it was, he came from Michigan and it was on Monroe Street late one Sunday night. And it was it was uh, suicide by cop. Um, and now, look, police officers have enough to deal with emotionally to get through now they understand the situation that they're in and I wish there was another way to go about it and maybe sometime in the very near future we can evade these types of instances um, but now that man's life is, is, is on their minds um, if you were to choose to take your life in some other way jumping off of a bridge stepping out in front of a bus uh, now other people have to deal with the pain of that rather than perhaps that person taking their life in the quiet of their own home. And I, I, I get it. Look, uh, this is hard to talk about and to listen to, but it's something that's very important to me as someone who has dealt with too many suicidal thoughts and ideations, and walking them through mentally in many ways that would, would, would terrify someone. Um, being closely familiar with ending one's life. Thankfully, it's never gone that far from me, as you know from listening to this podcast and so much more. Um, I would hope that no one would ever inflict their suicide on others because enough people are already affected who will miss you by you taking your life. And to add to that, for lack of a better way to put it, innocent bystanders, they don't deserve that. Um, Where was the other heavy topic? Yeah, this is, I spoke with with a friend, a friend of mine brought this up to me the other day. So then I I dug in a little bit further and I, whether it was something I Googled or I saw on Twitter somewhere, there seemed to be a very large amount of people asking their parents if they were vaccinated against polio. Since I saw it on the internet, I figure it was just, you know, the internet doing what it does and losing a lot of perspective and off and running. I guess we have, it's okay to have that perspective now, considering we're, we still haven't seemed to get gotten a lid on, on monkeypox right after uh, COVID. And there are echoes of the same mistakes in monkeypox as there are with COVID. Thankfully, uh, they are vastly different, but here we are. Um, I guess there's some polio. They found 
polio in, in wastewater in New York City, which we, we found out testing wastewater was a good way to see, a good way for us to get actual data about COVID rather than um, the way we have been doing it for so long. Tests, accurate, inaccurate, however long the wait was. Uh, it seemed like wastewater was a good way to get a better snapshot of who actually had it and how pervasive it was in a certain area. So I learned really quickly, um, if you're vaccinated against polio, you will not be paralyzed. If you're not, you could be paralyzed, as I believe the one person in New York was. Um, I asked my dad, <laughs> like all, like what was trending online, wherever I saw it, people asking their parents if they were vaccinated. And I, I, I was... Highly confident as I was, I was high, I was highly confident I was because thinking of the time frame when I was, uh, it wasn't that many decades. I don't actually know when we came up with the vaccination for polio. Was it that was it, was it my dad was born like forty nine? Was it around that time? Was it later? Anyway, I wasn't that long removed from being born in seventy nine that we had discovered. Was it Jonas Salk? Was was he the legend that we learned about in school? So I figured it was a pretty common thing when people of my age now were born to get vaccinated. Now, whether my dad misremembered or not, there are other people calling their uh, local like city health departments and whatnot to, to find out. So I hate to say it and I don't want it and I, and, and I don't even believe it, but if you want to say, here we go again. Yeah, let's wait. Let, let's wait and see. Uh, another thing, this goes back to Friday. You saw that um, some Sylvania families are suing the school because there uh, there is a lawsuit over the the buses and the busing practices. It seems the parents don't care that uh, school districts are short teachers, short bus drivers, short employees, and school districts have to make some very difficult decisions, which are going to be uh, displeasing to some. As we have seen over the last couple of years, um, we have rightfully. Lost faith in, in in a lot of institutions. There has been some really maybe questionable leadership at best, hard leadership at worst. Where we can go, how did we even how did we even allow you, or how did you get into this posi- into this position into this position? Um, adversity doesn't build character; it reveals it. And we have been through a heck of a lot of diversity in the last. Sorry, did I say advert? Sorry, my my, my for a month. It's Monday mouth. Um. Adversity reveals the character. We have been through nothing but seeming adversity over the last two and a half, what will be three years before we know it. Adversity has revealed a lot of failings in leadership and management, um, but not everywhere. Um, And I don't know how to measure this Sylvania thing, but it does seem somewhat in character for some people in that community and maybe mirrored some in Perrysburg. Um, but maybe equal to the failed leadership is entitlement of parents. And I think I know where that comes from, but I'm not going to spend any time on it because I don't want to have too many verbal missteps with that. But yeah, while, while I can say, yeah, there's been some bad leadership in a lot of places, um, entitlement and misplaced rage and lack of perspective Um, seems to have risen equal to that. With some of the things going on, the Salman Rushdie thing on Friday, as you know, I always like to say, there are always bad things going on. There always have been throughout history. Now we have more people than ever telling us how bad things are. But these are the interesting times from that Chinese proverb. And I don't know if I've... I think it's said to my dad and some other people I have some of these philosophical and intellectual discussions with some are here, but with other people as well. I wonder, with everything coming from COVID, and as I had said then, the virus, as many lives as it had taken, still does, everything else that it's done is far worse, as we're seeing now with the school shortages because of lack of employees and uh, the pay disparities all over and the pay that people are fighting for. We're getting close to the middle of the decade. Um, I do wonder if... These challenges, these fights, these wants, uh, these social battles and beyond will be, will mark the entire decade. I know we went into this decade um, just watching COVID over in China and we were all over here yelling, it's the roaring 20s. Like, 
what happened in the 20th century. I do wonder when we look back at the 2020s, what we will call this era and how many things will have been changed forever because COVID kickstarted them. It was the catalyst, but how many things changed? Hopefully that for the better. Race relations, gender relations, and beyond that, all the social ills that ail us. And hopefully we come out with a, be- with a better humanity. But we will see. I think a lot of this stuff will last through the decade. Um, one last thing. As seemingly something that never happens, um, the last episode or two never get in before you have to renew your membership. So then you get like three weeks of not needing that streaming service. I was fortunate. The two shows I was really enjoying on Apple, Blackbird with Taron Edgerton. Give that dude whatever Marvel role he wants. Um, And For All Mankind, which I binged in the spring. And as it so happened, this third season started as I wrapped up season two. All because very innocuously, very innocently, sometime in the spring... On a site that I don't read as much as I do, theringer.com, I've just backed away from it. A lot of the writers I enjoyed and podcasters on that site have left to go other places, and I have not followed them. I've just read this site less. said something about many people, maybe even Apple, are missing the fact that For All Mankind is some incredible TV. I'm like, I like space stuff. It's alternate history. Those are sometimes worth a shot. Uh, Man in the High Castle, never got into. Maybe at some point I should go back to that. But these alternate history shows, when they are actually pretty scarily accurate to where we are and reflection of where society, reflections of where society could be, make for some pretty compelling TV. Uh, there was one a couple of years ago. Alex got me on. I forget what streamer it was on. Maybe HBO. Um, where Charles Lindbergh was president and had a really good relationship with Nazi Germany. Very short miniseries, very good. Uh, this show for all mankind. Space, alternate history, an actor I like in Joel Edgerton. No. Joel, Joel. Joel, Ki- uh, Joel Kinnaman. Sorry, I do like Joel Edgerton, but Joel Kinnaman. So I was in, really enjoyed it. And uh, slight spoilers. Um, there, is all, there has always been deaths in this show and uh, of important characters, specifically in season two, that kind of sets the tone for things moving forward in season three for certain characters. And and they've already been through at least 30 years of this show in three seasons. Spoiler, it ends season three in 2003. So you're like 40 years ahead in this show. They, they jump fast. Point being, it's, and there are many other shows like this. Um, I've told you it's impossible to watch everything you you really want to. Um, Someone had pointed out, I read somewhere recently, that a lot of that is because there were so many shows that got backed up or just flat out stopped because of COVID, and then the dam opened, and we've got all this content this year. And I think I said that in 2020. Um, We don't have a lot of movies this year, but at some point we're going to get like just an onslaught. And we got that of... Marvel movies and and more in the last couple of years. The bottleneck broke open. We got that with streaming shows as well. Um, With this, it reminds me of Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, we fell in love. And remember, I was late to Game of Thrones. I don't think I watched In Step with the show till season five, maybe season six. So I remember going to see Man of Steel in, what, 2013 or 14? And he was telling me about the gore that he had witnessed with the Red Wedding and how a pregnant woman was murdered and discarded from the show. So, And I think I had heard or read about how Ned, the patriarch of the show, who you thought was the key character, was dead before the first season ended. So important people on this show were not long for it. Even Jon Snow, spoiler, was dead for a minute. Characters we we loved... We're not going to make it. Some did. Some made it to the very end, uh, but many of them did not. We had to pick up new loves along the way. And for all mankind, there are equal consequences to Game of Thrones. And um, there was less than I thought at the end of this show on Friday night, but there were some 
poignant ones. And when I watch these people, these these characters, and their time come to an end on the show, I was like, wow, I have not felt like this since Game of Thrones. Uh, a little different. She is a guest on a podcast she co-hosts for important reasons, for the important things she and her employer does in our community. Here's th- here's today's guest, Alex Thomas. Welcome to this week's edition of Cumulus Media Toledo's Contact Program. Happy to have you on. My name's Eric Chase, the afternoon host on Q105. Good to have you in the studio. One of my very dearest, closest friends since 2019 when, was it Crystal from NAMI who sent you over? It was Robin at my request okay. who sent me over. But I, I want to say it was actually like 2018. I feel like we've been friends for a solid four years now. It just feels like a long time. It wasn't 2018 because we didn't start. Uh, Floyd and I weren't doing our thing till the holidays of 2018. Oh, and then it was February, so, so it, was, it was right then. Yeah. yeah. So it's been a bunch of time now. We've been through a lot of stuff. You've mm-hmm. been through a lot of stuff. A lot of great things. Um, they, Robin and Nami wanted to get you over to me to talk about the Wellness and Recovery Center. Before we get to that and what you do, what what is NPI? I'm sure people see it in a lot of places, a lot of stories, but they have no idea what it is and the good they do in our community. So I'm really happy to talk about it today because I think it's today more than ever, it's really important to talk about NPI and what we do because of what's happening in our county. So neighborhood properties, were a housing organization, but we're not your traditional housing. You know, if you looked up a book of resources, you might find us under social services compared to housing and, and shelter. Um, and that's because we specifically house individuals that are homeless um, and that are living with a significant mental illness or struggling with substance use challenges. We find that um, a lot of homeless individuals, especially when it beco- homelessness becomes chronic, it co-occurs with undiagnosed or untreated mental illness. So we receive funding specifically to house individuals with those challenges, whether you're a single mom um, with kids or you're a veteran or you're a formerly incarcerated young adult or you're just a young adult, um, um, or you're just, uh, you know, of average age and you've had a, a struggle with housing your entire life. Maybe you had some evictions on your record and it really spoke to you struggling with depression. Therefore, you didn't go to work and then you didn't have money to pay your rent, those kinds of things. So we house people specifically for that reason and we provide them permanent housing. So they are housed with us until they don't need us anymore. They get case management services during that time, um, skill training for employment and or social uh, um expedited social security applications with us um, and they get peer services. They really get wraparound services their entire time they're with us. So I was just going to say, if you yeah. say wraparound services, somebody Sorry. throws me a $5 bill. <laughs> wraparound! <laughs> but really, so that we, the the goal is to avoid re-entry into homelessness. You know, the, and we know that the higher, the longer somebody has been homeless, so the more times that they've been homeless, the higher statistic is they will re-enter into homelessness. Do we have the what, what? What's the proper name for the head count that was done not that long ago to count up the homeless people in the community? The point in time count. So we call it. You, you hear. You most often hear it called the pit count. It's the point in time that stands for point in time that happens twice a year. It's a government HUD required activity um, because in each city all over the United States in January and in July. They're counting the number of homeless people that live there because that determines how much money we receive for homelessness um, services and support each year. So by people volunteering for the pit count and going out and counting how many homeless individuals are sleeping in a tent, sleeping on the street, sleeping in their car or sheltered. So there's sheltered and unsheltered homeless individuals living with homelessness. So um, how many are living in a shelter? How many are outside of the shelter in the street? Um, And then we take that number and that's how we advocate for getting dollars back down to our community. I don't think it ever truly reflects how many people are experiencing homelessness in our city because we know that people can couch surf, people can live on somebody's back porch, and the government doesn't determine that as homelessness anymore, um, couch surfing. I want to ask you the varying degrees of... Being without a, a person who doesn't have a home, I, mm-hmm. I don't want to misspeak, but I also don't want to say like unsheltered or sheltered. I'll come back to that in, in a second. Um, I'm guessing it's really just a, a, a rough estimate. There are some methodologies mm-hmm. in my line of work mm-hmm. that nothing is ever truly accurate, but they're they're the best estimates we can go by because I'm thinking about this and somebody might be visualizing the, the pit count where you and your team and others are actually counting people, what, through like 24 hours of, mm-hmm. of a day? Yeah. And it's just impossible. It's not 
not like you're going into a grocery store counting cans. Like people might not be in, in a particular spot. Like yes. how? What, what are the mechanics of the pit count? So it's we do one in the winter and one in the summer. The one in the winter is always the toughest because especially in January, sometimes like the nights that I have volunteered have been so bitter cold. I couldn't even handle it, let alone maybe somebody that that wasn't able to get into the shelter that night. Either the shelter was full or they got there too late. Now they're going to find an abandoned house and they're probably not coming out of that house. And so they're not getting counted. But what you will find is um, individuals are placed in teams. You get training. So the the Toledo Lucas County Homelessness Board, who does this pit count, Michael Hart and his team, um, Sheena Barnes and um, and those folks at the homelessness board, they they put on this pit count and you get a team of individuals together that have been trained by our path technicians at neighborhood properties. And they learn how to engage with the population and best practices. You have a team of people that go out at night and during the day um, and they go out at night and they're literally just driving around. And whether you're in a Kroger parking lot and you see someone that might look like they're experiencing homelessness, so you walk up to them and ask them. You know, where'd you sleep last night? And then based on their answer, you then ask them a series of questions. It's usually done by an app. Um, and and you give them a sandwich. You give them a backpack, um, something warm in the summer, something cold. Um, and so you're really giving them things to meet their needs and asking them a couple questions to meet our needs. Um, and there are tables that are in the eatery during the day. So there's always counting that's done at the shelters. But then there's counting that's done at the eatery. And I believe we also place people outside of the library that can say, hey, why don't you go down to the Mildred Bayer Clinic? There's a resource table. You can get food and backpacks and we can sign you up for insurance and there's lunch. You know, so we try to get them over to us to then um, count them, but then also give them the resources they need. As you describe this, I'm visualizing how this takes place. And I'm, I, I can't imagine that the margin of error is small. It would seem to be quite large i guess any number is better than no number right i'm also kind of thinking along lines of here and i don't think that you use this but technology and and drone technology might Mm -hmm. be helpful in some of these cases but i'm guessing that's not something that happens there's got to be a big gap between the estimate and the and the accurate number i believe so i'm i don't it's it gets tougher and tougher i mean there's individuals in the community that are known To some of the folks that are doing the volunteering, because like I volunteer for pit count. I work for an organization that houses homeless individuals, but I don't work for the homelessness board. And so I'm a volunteer as well as any other staff. But we work with this population. So we really know where the encampments are. We know where Joe likes to go and sleep at night. So we may be able to go over there and be like, hey, Joe, how are you? Let's get you this stuff. Why don't we ask you a couple of questions to see how you're doing? Um, But it really is important. It's important work. Um, because it helps neighbor, it helps us. I mean, getting the pit count will help us then get funding to be able to right. help the increased population of people experiencing homelessness. And the numbers are published. You usually can find them on the Homelessness Board's website. Have we gotten this summer's numbers? I don't think so. I'm do not you, sure. Do you remember the number from uh, from January? I don't. Okay. They went through a transition of leadership, so they might not be available, actually. Let me switch up here a little bit. Um, this is something that's come to my attention uh, over the uh, over the summertime. I, to me, it's quite paradoxical and, and, and maybe to others. And maybe it's just because I despise, Ugh. as you know, bitter cold weather. Ugh. Um, I, when it comes to extremes, I I prefer the summer heat rather than the, the, yes. the icy All winter day. cold. And I also, I, I've come across the idea and the fact that home, being, being, dealing with homelessness, being someone who is unsheltered in the summertime is far more difficult deadly than in the winter time i would think it would be quite the opposite again maybe i am just as someone called me long ago a snow wuss mm-hmm. um I, I picking some of that apart it, it makes some sense maybe more shelters are available in the winter time and whatnot in the summertime maybe more people are transient mm-hmm. um give me some of your your thoughts on on that what time of year is more deadly or dangerous for the people dealing with homelessness to be honest it's hard to say and i don't want to get too political but our winters are getting aggressively colder especially at night 
Um, so summers having, are getting hotter. Summer and right, but that exactly. So that dangerous heat of dehydration, we're getting more of that. We're experiencing yeah. more of that. We're also experiencing an increase in people out there experiencing homelessness. So there's just, and that, and sometimes, not all times. I definitely want to say not all the time, but sometimes when you're someone experiencing homelessness, there's also some desperation there. So it it could just be downright dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the winter time. It's so bitter cold. Some of our pit counts, I think it was last year, not this year, but maybe the year before, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to do it because of how cold it was. It was going to be dangerous to our volunteers. And I, luckily, we were able to do it. But um, So it, it really is a challenge. I don't know if I can say which is safer because I think that they both have challenges that make it extremely unsafe. Whether you ha- yourself have health conditions, there's a lot of older adults that are out there in the street. A lot of um, adults living with disabilities out there on the streets, whether it's a physical disability or a mental health disability. I mean, you see some that are just really in bad shape and they need somebody that's going to stop and say, hey, can I help you? You know? I can't. I can't imagine this being the case, but maybe it's just some conventional wisdom that now needs to change with new data that we have. You think of the dead of winter. Obviously, you think of the cold, but uh, a foot of snow. And maybe there are places that are more apt to take people in who are battling or dealing with homelessness, as opposed to the summertime, where sometimes there is there's we deal with deadly heat waves and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But on an eighty three degree day, maybe people are less likely to help others because. I, I always ran this little thought experiment through my head. If I was ever going, if I was ever going to have a homelessness battle, it would want to be in San Diego. San Di- <laughs> so San Diego has a very high population of home, people experiencing homelessness that don't go into the shelter. So they really are panhandling at the lights. I, I've been to San Diego many times and um, actually spoken with people that work in homelessness out there. And it, there's so many of them what? because the the climate is. Yeah. It's, I hate to say perfect for it. No, you're but right. It's, what makes it attractive to want to live there year round as mm-hmm. a resident also makes it easier in some ways to to deal with homelessness mm-hmm. because the extreme temperatures aren't in play. But more people then living unsheltered, more people right. needing the help. Uh, let me ask you this. We have seen, obviously, the effects and the tentacles of COVID in the last handful of years. Just anecdotally speaking and the, uh, speaking and the things I come across homelessness has gone up i mean even even the facts would line up uh job loss uh people being unable to access help with bills like when the city offered rent Mm -hmm. payment and whatnot maybe people just didn't know about it for one reason or another their internet got turned off there has to be a larger percentage of people who are homeless now than a couple of years ago do we have any numbers on that and how that has affected things the last number i saw and that's not something that we specifically collect but the last number i saw was there was something like an 800 percent increase in first-time homelessness sounds so about right people experiencing first-time homelessness and and that didn't specify if they were you know able to go stay at their mom's but they themselves didn't have a place of their own anymore because we know the government doesn't consider that homeless anymore the uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development says that if you're couch surfing or staying on someone's couch, you're not considered homeless, so you wouldn't qualify for resources. Um, you would need to be in a shelter, out on the street, in your car, or in an inhabitable or abandoned building. Um, so who's to say? But that was the last number that I saw. Um, we do, at Neighborhood Properties, we take calls from 211 for people looking for housing, and we get dozens a day from first time callers for people that are like I and and each one of them are in such a state of panic as they should because this is either the first time they experience this crisis or our shelters are full and they just don't have anywhere to go. And so we are doing our best to help each person um Obviously, we have specific qualifications, but we can help them get housed elsewhere with our PATH program. So they don't necessarily have to even because we're the landlords as well. So we're the social service being the case managers, but we also own the properties that they're living in. And so maybe they are not going to our property, but we are helping them to go somewhere. Last question when it comes to a person who is homeless and then we'll swing over to the Wellness and Recovery Center with some positive stories and what they do for what you do for the community. What are the varying degrees of being homeless uh you mentioned couch surfing Mm -hmm. that that is not seen by some or by the government um that creates the funding that helps the funding as homeless so what are the varying degrees on that spectrum of someone who is unhoused unsheltered 
Um, so like I mentioned, you could be someone living in, and you find this in the wintertime, a lot of these abandoned homes that we have in the community, you might find somebody staying in them um, in the wintertime just to get through it. Somebody that's staying in a shelter, so actually does have a bed and has been in a shelter for whether it's two days or it's um, three months, you know, that would be considered somebody experiencing homelessness. How about their vehicle or a vehicle? A vehicle would qualify. And then just the street, literally just somebody staying on the steps of a, a building, which we have had. That's also considered somebody experiencing homelessness. The Wellness and Recovery Center, um, as I think you first described it to me, we're where a florist used to be on Glendale, behind the Kroger. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The um, old Glendale flower. It's, uh, is it, Wellness Recovery Center is about three and a half years old? Uh, 2018. It's, it's like the length Four. of our friendship. Yeah, literally, yeah. So what does the Wellness and Recovery Center do for people? So we're a short-term respite care facility, and we are here specifically to help people who don't really meet the qualifications of a psychiatric crisis um, or a psychiatric emergency or even a drug and alcohol crisis, which could be uh, using to the point of um, harming themselves or maybe somebody that's sober and they are concerned that they're going to use again. So we can work with that population or somebody that's just like having such a stressful moment that they can, they're beside themselves and they're having a hard time existing in the world around them. Like most people in the last two and a half years. <laughs> like me in the last few days. Yes. So um, Wait, That's wedding stuff, by the way. That's oh, wedding whoops. stuff, by the way. <laughs> yes. So um, we are uh, like a retreat for them. We're a, res- a short-term respite care facility so that we can help them up to seven days where they stay with us. And the staff are all peer staffed, so they all have lived experience and they use their experience to help other people just really find improvement in their life and whatever that looks like for them. Um, it's free, correct? I can just walk in. How, oh, wait, no, I know that it's not that easy, but what is the process to be <laughs> someone who can be a resident? So we like to say it's at no charge to the there community members. Okay. It's not free because the funding comes from somewhere, right? right? Nothing's free, right? Uh, exactly. So we're generously funded by the tax levy that just passed. I think it was issue four. Shame on me for not knowing it. was 11. It. It was, no, I the think bl- it was 11 last time. The black and yellow signs. The black and, yes, the mental health board um, tax levy funds us. So the tax dollars that go into that levy that gets approved at overwhelmingly 80, 85, 90% um, comes back to you in, do- in services like ours. So we don't charge, we don't bill. You do have to be a Lucas County resident for that reason and an adult. Um, but, so over 18. Over 18, correct. But we do our best to kind of help people as best we can. We try to eliminate those barriers, but you would initiate it with a call, a phone call, whether it's to the emotional support line or to the wellness center. And then we would talk to you about getting a referral completed. And usually the turnaround time is within 24 hours. Let me ask you a somewhat personal question. Mm -hmm. Um, I am frequently over at the Walmart on Glendale. Frequently there is a person or two and different people regularly who are without homes asking for money. Right there at the light. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you ever do you ever want to just walk down the street or pull up beside beside them and have you ever asked them if you can help them? So our team does. We usually, I mean, neighborhood properties, we employ, I want to say 60 to 70 people. And so we all have our own lives out here in, in Lucas County and in Wood County and all these other places. And when we're not working, we're st- we still see it. And so we're passing cards along. So that would be a, one of our path outreach technicians that would go out there. So that's the individuals that work for us that physically have the vans, go out and meet with them and put them in the van and take them to have an assessment done right away, usually right away. Um, so, yeah, we, we try to engage with them as best we can and we'll pass cards out and give them our information. The wellness center isn't usually the greatest resource because that's for individuals that are experiencing something related to emotion or a psychiatric crisis. Not to say homelessness isn't that, but um, the need for somebody coming into the center is sometimes different. Um, Final couple of things here. I've heard two on one, which is a United way thing, right? Um, Emotional support line. What is that number? Uh, 419-442-0580. What are some other resources that people can tap into, whether it's the wellness and recovery center, uh, neighborhood properties, or maybe something underneath the mental health and recovery services board. So the emotional support line is available Monday through Friday from 8am or I'm sorry, seven days a week from 8am to midnight. So you can call just if you need somebody to talk to at 
any point in the day. But there's also ZEF crisis. And you'll when you call the emotional support line, there's an option that if you're actually in a crisis where you might feel like, listen, I really feel like I'm getting ready to harm myself or hurt another person. I'm hearing these voices and I don't know how to make it stop. I'm not getting any sleep. Then you would want to call ZEF crisis. And that number is um, 419-904-CARE. So that's our new crisis, our county crisis service provider. Um, and that's really important. I know that there's a crisis text line as well, but I really love the emotional support line. Not to say that I don't encourage that. I love the emotional support line number and I love ZEF crisis because those are local resources. Mm -hmm. If you're a local person, you're going to talk to somebody that is very familiar with the Walmart on Glendale or is very familiar with the guy that sleeps out on the steps over on Washington and Erie, you know, so we can talk to you about those things. And we're just even if we're we're going through like a community tragedy when Officer Dia passed and some of the other officers, we knew what people were experiencing when they called in because we also were experiencing it. So, yeah, something that I had found out, actually, uh, Robin from NAMI pointed it out that uh when 988 came into existence mm -hmm. in the middle of July, mm -hmm. it wasn't necessarily just a suicide hotline coming from the 273 talk number. I should know that number by heart, but I really don't. <laughs> I just think of the Logic song still um, and why he's had no big hits since then. Oh, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> that was a good song. It was a very good song. And one could argue it really kicked the door down of mental health for yeah. many people. Uh, but 988 is, is like a crisis line um, in addition to everything. Yes, and I know yes. there was some pushback, like what you had mentioned. Some people might... May, there was pushback that it wasn't local. Um, and when you're talking about like local crisis, like what you brought up with Officer Dia or other tragedies, it helps to know the lay of the land. Right. But I would never tell some, I would never shun somebody or tell them not to call a line because they're going to get somebody in Nebraska. If you're in a crisis and you can get a trained person, just make the just damn call. It. Yeah. And sometimes that might entice people because they know that they're not possibly going to speak to somebody that, that might know them. I know the 988, uh, it's always important, but it may add an extra barrier where instead of you calling 911, which we know there's mental health resources in the community. So if you're having a mental health crisis, call Zeph. You, it's just as easy as calling 911. You'll get somebody out and they'll dispatch a team to come out to you and, and you know, they'll be able to help you when, because police and EMS resources really should be used for other things. Not to say that mental health emergencies aren't true and authentic emer emergencies, but with 988, then they have to call someone and have somebody sent to you instead of you calling that direct person. You bring up a good point of the reverse of what I mentioned for the pushback. Um, let's use like Zef 419- 904-CARE. 904-CARE. Which is 2273. Let's say I'm, I'm on the other end of that phone call and I get someone who doesn't want to speak to a, a local person. They want that complete and total vanilla objectivity. Mm -hmm. I pick up the phone, I'm like, Alex, is that you? Are you are you worried about the wedding? Are you worried about the wedding? And then all of a sudden you freeze with fright because you know this person. So I can yeah. see it working both ways. The bottom line is there are more resources than ever. And that's why we can never talk about them enough. Right. That's exactly right. And I think that um, in our county, Lucas County, we've been working really hard to make um, our services reflective of what our population needs, whether it's housing and continuing to funnel dollars into housing and homelessness or it's mental health and making sure we do have a crisis provider, a good crisis provider, but we also have a respite care facility. And then we have a drop in center that's the Thomas Werner Center and all of these resources that can really give somebody a well-rounded um, experience with mental health care, whether it's you needing the care or your family member calling for you, you're not going to be that person that's like, I don't know what to do and I don't know who to call because there's many, there's a, there's a clear path of what you, what you can do. Many of these places offer the kind of wraparound services Wrap that can give around. you a pathway to success. <laughs> oh, I'm That's, hitting all the keywords. We're getting rid of pathway too at the end of the year. I'm getting all the keywords in. Last thing, the, the buzzwords, mental health buzzwords. Last thing, uh, what is a way people can get in touch with neighborhood properties if they know of someone who could use housing? So our um, phone number is 419-473-2604. You would listen to the prompt. I believe it's option nine if you're somebody that is interested in housing housing. But when you call that number, you'll hear my lovely voice directing you on what number to press. You can also dial 211, which is the United Way resource that will usually transfer you to neighborhood properties if they themselves don't have a resource at the time. There's a struggle in our community and we know this. Our homeless shelters are at capacity. And so the homeless
homelessness board and two one one are having to get creative with how we're going to help the growing population of people experiencing homelessness. So it always changes what what's allowed, what can happen, um, changes all the time. So you, um, I really encourage you to call two one one even if you've already called us because that we're not the only resource in the community. Alex Thomas, Neighborhood Properties, Wellness and Recovery Center, Getting Married, My yeah. Best Friend. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Cumulus Media Toledo's contact program. Thanks for being here. We'll catch you next Sunday across our Cumulus Media stations. Bye-bye.